Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Mark, and uh, I'm doing another video. I want to do an extensive video. Hopefully, it doesn't take very long, but I think a lot of times um, you'll see bits and pieces of this on the internet. You'll see some people talk about the music industry or how the music industry is messed up or how artists get screwed over. Uh, there's a lot of variable factors in um, why the music industry can be so hard to break into. And I'm a, the main, the really overall is the music industry can be um, easy or can be hard. Depends on what level or what attribute or what basically the level of the part of the music industry you want to be. The music industry is actually what people think when they think of the music industry. They think of the nationwide or international s scale level of the music industry. A lot of people don't think about, like, if you're performing at local clubs, uh, local uh, venues around your town, and you have a low, you know, maybe you're in a local band, and you're just doing a lot of top 40 cover mu music and things like that, that is still part of the music industry because it's still entertaining people. It's just not on the label on a major scale like you would see your major artists, you know, Usher, Beyonce, Mariah Carey, and so forth. You just, you know, on that level, Stevie Wonder, I can go on and on and on. But if you are performing in clubs, you're doing uh, local venues, you're traveling around, uh, and you're just performing locally, you're in the music industry. It's just not on that scale. Now, most people, when they think of music industry, they want to go on to the main, they want to be on Jay-Z's level. You know, they want to be on uh, Trisha Yearwood, you know, maybe Carrie Underwood, um, you know, U2, Nirvana, the big, the big names, the Rolling Stones and so forth. People want to be on that level because what they're seeing is TV and the media and all that makes it make it appear that if you're on that level, you're making millions of dollars. The problem is majority of the people that you think are making million dollars are probably not the people that you're seeing. Most of the time, it's the people that are making most money are like record labels and a lot of uh, players, key people behind the scenes that have multiple um people under its belt that are making money more than maybe just the particular artists that you may be thinking of the videos can be misleading because you can watch music videos in these you know, or you can watch mtv cribs or things like that and that will make you think oh that artist is getting paid because they're half that stuff is such a front and a lot of it gets exposed that it's um really not realistic or accurate so there are artists that do make lots of money, but it's a rare exception because you'll find out there are a lot of circumstances as to why certain artists may have multi millions of dollars while others do not. Okay, so I'm gonna get into the slide and I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna be going back and forth on some of these slides, but I want you to get the, the big picture of the music industry and I'm gonna try to, even though this video is not going to be very, very long, it's going to be it's going to be somewhat lengthy, but not very long. You have to understand that um, this is just a brief summary of what's going on, so you'll get a bad, a better understanding in case you're trying to become a recording artist. Now, in the music industry, traditionally there are four key areas: the record labels, and the rec and the record labels that contract recording artists recording artists get record deals which the contract has them signing a contract that says the artist is going to sing songs for the record label which means that the record label are going to own whatever material that these recording artists are going to sing um f and generally uh even if it's a band or a group and uh, even if the band writes his own songs, if that's negotiating the contract, or the group writes their own song in the contract, they still might be under a contract where no matter what the recording artist, group, or band writes, or 
and re- go to a recording studio to record, the record label is going to own whatever they do. And it just depends on the contract. Now, the other two actors is publishing companies and songwriters. Because most recording artists have a contract where they have no creative control, well, the um, record labels, which usually most of the time will own the publishing company, but sometimes um, the publishing companies are their own publishing companies, and they'll have publishing agreements, and they'll hire and contract songwriters to write songs. Now, there, when I get into copyrights, there are two different types of songs. There's songs and then there's sound recordings. And um, we'll get into composition and stuff like that a little bit later in the video. But um, so right now, we're just talking about the key, four key players. Now, the record labels usually own the masters of the recording artists until all that's renegotiating contracts later on. Publishing companies usually own all the library of material. This way, it allows the publishing company to use those material, those songs, any way they seem fit um, with an agreement between the publishing publishing company and the songwriters. Now, you're going to hear this. Why is it important for you as a recording artist to own their masters and own their own publishing? And the reason being because there are two things in the music industry that makes money, performances and songs. Songs are used in so many different ways that can make more than just performing, than more than just the recording artist. Because a recording artist is also a performance art, a performing artist. Meaning they go to, when they go to the studio to record, they're a recording artist. But when they're out touring, they're a performance artist. The songs that they that they recorded and became famous on in every place that you know about are what we call intellectual property that can be used in so many different ways. And this is how most of the time the record labels and publishing companies and songwriters make money more than the recording artists do. That's why it's such a crucial uh, that these songs, and, there, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about how these songs make these record labels, publishing companies, and songwriters money. And then the recording artists have to find a way to circumvent the system so they're making the money. So, so now here's some things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the front load um, versus the back end. And the front load is usually where majority of the money is given up front. But if the most of the majority of the money is going to be given up front, mainly advances. And most of the time, the recording artists, when they sign a record contract, won't see anything on the back end because everything's given up front. Then we're going to talk about a little bit about recoupments. We're going to talk about advances and studio calls, a little bit about publishing, copyrights, the RIAA, which is the Recording Industry Association of America. We're going to talk about Billboard. Excuse me when I start sniffing and stuff like that. I'm congested. We're going to talk about Billboard and awards and academies and talents and performances. We're going to talk about budgets, you know, why record labels. It's easier with a record company, but there are so many cons to it versus being independent. Then we're going to talk about PROs, performance right organizations, distribution companies, and the cost of touring, which is the heart of an artist's survival. Now, with the performance right organizations, one of the things that an artist is going to be associated with is they're going to be associated with one of these, mainly the main three, but there's there's lots of them because there are uh, performance right organizations for international countries, overseas countries, but the main for the United States, BMI, which is the Broadcast Music in, uh, Incorporation, ASCAP, which stands for American Society of Authors, uh, Songwriters, and Publishers. And then there's CSAC, which stands for Society of European um, Songwriters, or I'm sorry, European Stage Authors and um, Composers. And then there's GMR, which is Global Music Rights. But we're mainly concentrating on BMI and ASCAP as the main two. 
So, and then of course there's sound exchange and there's sound scan. Now, billboard charts monitor sound scan because sound scan is the company which is Nielsen Sound Scan where they're attaching a UPC, you talk about barcodes and ISRC, International Sound uh Sound um I believe it's International Sound of uh, Recording Code or something like that that's attached to each individual song on a whether it's a single or on a particular CD. And then there is the UPC, which is the barcode, which is the entire cell of, like, for example, a CD, the barcode on the back. So every time a CD is sold or vinyl or cassette or whatever the case, whatever type of physical format media that is attached to, that that bill code, just like anything else, all companies have barcodes on to track their sales in different distributors, such as Walmart, Target, any place that sells product, including Amazon. So there's a barcode. So they track that, and as, as the sales, the more and more sales, the as a particular song or album moves in sales, the more it sells, the more it moves up the charts. This is how billboards, this is how billboard charting does that. So if the sales go down, it moves down on the charts. If the sales go up, it moves up in the charts. So um, rarely, if something goes up the charts, rarely if it goes back down the charts, that it moves back up in charts. Um, if it goes, it reaches a certain point, and then after that, just nothing. It, after that, it just starts going down because the sales have to start declining. So that's um, how Billboard. But Sound Exchange is the company that deals with digital downloading. So an artist, which if they're part of a record label, they will automatically be uh, registered with SoundScan and Sound Exchange. They will also be registered with one of the PROs, either BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, and so forth. The record labels do this, but as an independent, you have to do this yourself. As an independent, an independent has to do everything themselves. That's the difference. Now, the recording studio, which most people get on the internet, because most people think that the recording studio and creating and recording music where you're going to record, mix, and, and create music, and then you're just going to upload it or whatever case, that's success. And that can be if that's your ultimate goal is just record it, songs, put it on a couple of uh, websites, and then hope that you get the attention. But uh, I'm going to tell you why that most of the time is probably – not going to gain you a whole lot of success and i'm gonna tell you why i guarantee like for even people that watch my channel if you have music uploaded to reverb nation or soundcloud the chances are i've never heard of it because i don't know that it exists and if i don't know that it exists guess what the millions of people that you're hoping are not going to know that it exists either the only people that's going to know that exists is the people that know about it, which means that if you told friends and family and they told friends and family and they told friends and family, they'll look, and they start following you on like Reverb Nation and SoundCloud, those are only are only going to be the people. Those are, are only going to be the people that's going to know about it. Other than that, most people are just not going to know about it. And that's the reason why. You got millions of people on Reverb Nation and SoundCloud trying to do that. And they'll go to, they can even go to a professional studio or might do it in a home studio. And they're trying to do this and they'll go and create this music and they'll upload it to SoundCloud or Reverb Nation and so forth. And then they, they're, they're hoping for the best. Well, it's like I said, there are probably people on my channel. I've never heard their music because, and you know, I have a lot of people, they'll, They'll sit there and some people will even put links in the comments of my YouTube channel and say, hey, go check this out. Go check this out. And uh, I don't have the time to do that. I really don't. Um, and so and even if that was the case for me to, to be able to listen to uh, and they'll probably do this on lots of people's channel, hoping to gain attention. The problem is. 
you would have to do this to a million people if you want to get a million people to listen to your stuff. And chances are 10% of those million people might listen to it. And there's a lot of other factors why people will either like it or they don't because that's just the nature of people. But anyhow, moving on. So let's talk about the home, re home recording studio and the professional studio. This is where most recording artists think that this is where the success is going to happen. And this is not. A recording studio is nothing more than a factory. It's like, for example, you have to look at it like a car. Whenever a Ford, Chevy, Toyota, Honda, whatever is made at a factory, it does no good if it's at the factory. The only place that that car is going to do any good for that car to be sold, it has to get to a distribution place, meaning the Ford car lot. And there are lots of Ford car lots. You know, there might be, there might be Johnson's Ford or Winston and Winston and Beals Ford or whatever the case may be, whatever the name of the Ford dealership in your town. That's the only way you're going to be able to buy that Ford. The same thing with that Honda or that Chevy. It has to get to a distributor. The same thing when you make music is made, it has to get to a distributor, i.e. Walmart, Amazon, so forth. But the recording studio is just a factory. That's all a recording studio is. Some factories, and when it comes to recording studios, unlike where you have a set factory for a car, uh, you know, where it's going to go on a assembly line. Well, that's the same concept. Your music is being on the assembly line. You know, you're making uh, all these music. But there, the difference in a recording studio is not every recording studio is equal. And it can be done in a home studio or a pro studio. And both of them have their pros and cons. But this is where all the recording, mixing, and, ma and mastering may or may not be done. So you have to look at it in that sense. Now, when it comes to um, the studio, the cost of a pro studio, if someone was looking to do a, a recording studio, your budget, the cost of a pro studio can range anywhere from a half a million, which is $500,000, and up into the millions, not including the rent or lease of the building, lights, security system, staff, insurance, which are separate expenses whether they have clients or not. So we're not, you know, we're not even talking about, we're talking pro studios, you're talking microphones, speakers, uh, the, the, the cost to actually do the control room and the live room, the mixing console, the monitors, and so forth. I mean, we're talking lots of money. It's very, very expensive. Now, a home studio can range anywhere from 300 bucks to as much as a pro studio. Dep it depends on what the homeowner is willing to spend and invest. So, the pros and cons of a pro studio. The pros are you're going to get a professional, you know, you're going to have it's going to have professional equipment, engineers, staff, maintenance crew. You're going to get professional recordings. It's going to be the best in the business. That's just what it is. As far as the cons. The cons is there's time limits, you know, as far as how much time you could be in the studio, when you could be booked to get the time in the studio, and the cost. It can range anywhere from, you know, a uh, few hundred dollars a day to as much as thousand dollars a day, and you only have so much time. The pros of a home studio is there's no time limit. It's way more affordable in cost to run, build, and set up a home studio. But the cons are you may or may not match the level of a pro studio as far as the quality of the recording. The noise, and you know, you're talking about outside noise or inside noise, and it's hard or nearly impossible. Well, let me repeat that. It's hard, very hard, or nearly impossible to book established industry clients, such as Mariah Carey, Justin Timlake, for, as an example. The other con is the risk of unknown clients scoping your home, meaning not everyone, if you're going to have a home studio that's open to the public, not everyone is going to want to come in there to actually physically record. Some people come in there to actually scope and see what you got, and then hopefully that maybe one day you're not home, they'll break in and steal what you got. That's just the callous of people. It's the sorriness of people. That's why I don't feel sorry for people that break into people's homes 
because they're too sorry to go out and earn the stuff for themselves. You know, when people break into people's cars or homes or whatever, them some, those are some sorry people because those people didn't want to take the time to do, and these people work hard to earn the stuff they got. So, now, there are three record labels uh, under corporations, the big three, Warner Brothers, Sony Music Group, and Universal Music Group. And then there's independent labels, and of course, there's just independent artists. I didn't put a whole lot of detail. I didn't put a whole lot of details for uh, because I, this is something that a person can research. If you go look at Warner Brothers and look at all the record labels under Warner Brothers, and then if you look up on the record labels, I would advise and see each of those record labels. Who, what artist is assigned? Got a contract with those particular con with those particular record labels. Same thing with Moni Sony Music Group. Same thing with Universal Music Group. And then look, try to find independent labels. And then, of course, if you have to look at as just you know being an independent artist, and you have to look at the pros and cons of all of it, because independent labels work like major labels. The difference between the major labels and the independent labels is budget. Independent labels do not do not have the budget to push artists like major labels. Because major labels, what separate, what really makes like the big three, Warner Brothers, Sony Music Group, and Universal, is they're not only have record labels, they have TV and film. And TV and film also makes them billions of dollars. That's why they can afford to uh, do what they do with record, uh, with artists that independent labels cannot. So um, you just have to weigh it and look at it. That's a research project for someone that might be watching this video. Now, uh, the con contribution of artists contributing to the music industry, here's the percentages of artists coming out of these different, these, these, uh, these different, and of course there's EMI group, but I think EMI group fell under universal. But you can see the percentages who has the biggest, uh, the most record labels would be Universal, then Sony, then, me, then you know, of course, Warner Music. And then there's Independent that are contributing to the parts of the market of these uh, record labels that are making. Uh, excuse me for the explosives <laughs> that's coming through the, that's because I'm using this dynamic mic. I really don't have a, uh, I need to put a, I'm a, trying to angle the mic because I keep hearing that. And so I apologize for that in the video. So, um, so that's where you can look and see and uh, see which record label has record, which one, which one of these groups have record labels and how much percentage of the market they're taking. So, so that lets you know who's signing the most artists that's making the biggest impact. Now here's, here's a slide. You can always pause the video and just take a look at this. You know, these are some of the examples of what some of the ter some certain terms of a record contract and and publishing deals. You can kind of look at this and read this for yourself. Uh, what some of the general uh, basics of how some of these record contracts will be written up. Um, so just take a look at that. You can always pause the video and read that. The next part of the video is, like I said, I'm not going to read it. You can always pause the video and read this, but I want you to, I want people to read this. Here are the pros and here uh, when it comes to, uh, and the cons. One of the things with the pros to uh, a record label is, you know, there's larger promotional budgets. They have way more connections. They can get an artist out there way faster within a few I mean, it can happen overnight in some instances for an artist if they have a record that's pushing them. Um, the cons is resources spread among many acts. Some of them have staff turnovers and limited personal attention and limited uh, negotiating leverage when it comes to a record deal. Those are, so you can read that. Um, so here's the thing. Some record labels 
will can sign an artist from anywhere from a one to a seven CD deal. It depends on the sale of a CDs. They with the option to drop an artist after the first CD if they don't see any sales or any positive, you know, whatever the case. Or an artist can be signed to a record label and they might not even want to release whatever the artist presents um, because they might not feel that it's going to make the record label any money. You got to remember this thing when it comes to the music industry is about what can a record, what can uh, an artist make me? You know, when they scout talent, they're seeing it, they're looking at the talent. A lot of times the artists think that the artists, when they see these record labels, they're looking at them because they think they're just this great, amazing talent. But what these record labels and these business people are looking at these people with this talent is, wow, that person's good enough. I wonder how much money they can make me. I want to see how much I can use their talent to make me money. That's how they look at it. It's a fact of life, but it, that's exactly what it is. So you have to prepare yourself for that. Now, sometimes an artist can go in a studio. You got to be careful with because you only get so much of that money to go in a studio. And you got to be careful with the music that you're making because it gets to the point where they could put you on the shelf. Basically, they're not going to push you. And now you're just sitting, but you're in a, you're under contract. So you can't, you can't do anything because you're under contract. And now you're just sitting and they're not pushing you. They're not marketing you. They're not doing anything. So it's a lot of pros and cons to, uh, to being on a record contract. Once again, here are some of the cons. And, uh, you read this for yourself, and this is just a basically, you can read that. So you can always pause the video and read that. That's the cons of being on a record label. Now, here is the pros of a, as an independent artist. You can stop, pause the video, and read that for yourself. And then here are the cons. Now, a record label is usually structured like this. You know, you're going to have the president or the CEO or, you know, the top person of the record label. They're going to have their legal department. And then, of course, they're going to have their, you know, their, their business affair department where they, how they're going to conduct their business as a record label. And then there's, their, there's the executives and vice president that's going to deal with uh, the different portions of the record label as far as people who's doing what in the label. You have your A&R, which is your artist and repertoire section. Those are the people that bring artists to the label that's telling the record label, uh, I got this artist we need to sign because I know this person can make us money because their talent is going to make us money. Now, the pros to that is a record label can bring like Destiny's Child and then uh, all of a sudden, even though Destiny Child might not have the success as a group, but then you have breakout artists from that group, such as Beyonce, and she can renegotiate their contract to have her own solo contract and uh, become this high-paying independent artist, and voila. And it happens because Beyonce starts selling records on her own and so forth. And then, of course, there's the promotional team that's going to make sure Beyonce becomes successful. And, of course, if an artist brings a, uh, an artist to a record label and they flop, well, the record label not only can drop the artist, they can drop the a &R person. That's one of the one positions in the record label that probably get the, has the highest turnover because a lot of a &R people get fired. <laughs> so I don't mean to laugh, but it's the fact of, you know, uh, the nature of the record label because it's about money to a record label. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, another promotion, of course, they're going to design the label. Uh, the promotion section is going to sign. They're going to ones that are going to design the record, uh, the sleeve. You know what the what the CD is going to look like. You know all that and so forth. Artist development is the is the section where they're supposed to help the artists become supposed to groom the artist. You know. They're not a good dancer. They try to make them to a good dancer. If they're, you know, choreographers and stuff like that, how to make sure they can know how to perform in a on a show. 
but there are a lot of record labels that don't want to, you know, their artist development departments have faded away. So artists have to learn how to seek out on their own and find their own dance choreographers and out of their own money and time. Um, then, of course, there's the marketing department. You know, of course, we know that's self-explanatory. They're going to concentrate on sales of CDs and digitals and stuff like that. And they're also going to sell, you know, there's the art department. You know, they're the ones not only designing art, you know, they're going to make sure that they get where, you know, the artist is going to take professional photos, things like that. There's the, you know, where publicity department, they're the ones that are doing a, you know, helping the market department, you know, you know, get things marketed out there. There's marketing and promotion. Marketing is putting everything out there for people to see. Promotion is pushing what's already out there, you know, and so forth. Publicity, you know, they're going to try to draw in um, as much attention to this label. See, look, look at the, look at us. We got some of these top acts and air is a competition thing between all these record labels. And of course, you know, the media department and so forth. So this is basically the structure of a record label, but because record labels aren't really making money with, with sales because uh, all record labels are only as, as strong as their sales. And because nothing's really selling, most record labels are starting to shut down because everything's dependent on sales. Now, here is the biggest, here's the, here's the gorilla in the room. The gorilla in the room is typically Who's getting paid? And you could take a look at this chart. And this was an average under a record label. 63 to 80% on average went back to the record label. It all depends on the point system or the percentage point percentage of record sales. And uh, that was one part thing I forgot to add in the slide was how the point system worked, which remind me, I'll do it in another video. As you can see, it's already going on 33 minutes. And I'm not even scratching half the surface. This is a lot of information. So you can see right here, out of 63% went to record label, then a good 24% went to distributors to get the music all to all the distributors out there. Only about 13 to 18% went to the artist. And out of that 18%, the artists still have to pay whether it's the artist have to is gonna get a certain percentage by themselves because they're a solo artist or there's a group or a band, they all have to split. And the artist, what's going to happen is the prefer the personal manager, which is the artist manager, the business manager, the lawyer, the road manager, and a producer all get paid first before the artist because they're going to make sure that the artist pays all these people or the artists have to pay all these people. So you can see after all that, out of that little 13 to 18%, how much the artist is going to have to pay all these people before they can get a check. So it, something would go simple like this. If you sold 500,000 units, which is a half a million, that's considered certified gold. Out of that, 4.2.5 million went to the, to the record label. That left the artist setting... $750,000. Well, $750,000, when you look at how much percentage it's got to be paid to the personal manager, you know, the business manager, the role manager usually get about 5% to the lawyer and then the producers. And then after all that, so you're looking at this, you know, 15,000 here, 25,000 there, 30,000 there, whatever the case. So now what's left over is probably just under about four hundred thousand dollars divided between if the artist if it's a solo artist they get the four hundred thousand dollars, but if it's a group, you know you got to split that four hundred thousand dollars between one, two, three, four. How many people are in the group? So the money gets divided real fast. So you got four people, four hundred thousand. That's a hundred thousand dollars. But here's the problem: you still got recoupments, fees, torn fees, advances, and everything else that has to be paid back to the label first, because all that percentage that's coming from that went to the record label from the sales, 63% or whatever case, that's separate from the recoupment fees, advances, and everything else, touring fees and everything else that they that they fronted the artist. So most of the time, the artist is negative because they have to pay all that. So because they're negative, they can't pay the artist, lawyer, personal manager, business manager until they, so the artist is forced to go on tour 
to try to make some of that money back up. So now you can see where this thing gets it gets things starts to get ugly real quick for this for this artist or group or band. Um, it becomes a real hassle, but that's what happens when you sign a contract. Now the artist, who's all you know, when it comes to the artist, who the artist is obviously got to pay first. Well, like I said, you have to pay the artist manager, business manager, road manager, producers, lawyers. Then the members of the, you know, the members such as the artists themselves, the group or band, and security and so forth. Now, the record label collects before the artists get paid. So they're going to collect all advances and studio calls, promotional calls, touring advances, recruitments of living and travel expenses, i.e. restaurants, clothes, food, limos, damage calls, sales losses, and everything else. They're going to recoup all that. And this is separate from the sales. This is why so many people think that record labels are shady. But the reason that, you know, the record labels excuse for why they're recouping all this is because they, well, you, you know, as an artist, you would think, well, you're getting all that money. So, you, you know, they were thinking, um, you know, they're thinking to themselves, well, you're getting all this percentage of money if the artist knows about it. You're getting all this money. But see, the record labels say, well, no. We have to collect all this because we have to pay not only the staff of everyone that works at the every everyone we have to pay all these people that work at the record label, all these different departments at the record label, we have to pay them. But we also have to pay for artists that are not selling like you are. You know, a record label can have 15, 20, 30 artists on it, and only three of the artists are selling CDs. You know, there's a good, you know, most of the time, on average, they can have 30 artists and only four, what is it, less than less than 15% is successful to even go become certified gold. So, now copyrights. Understanding copyrights, this is just a little bit for you to read. Copyrights basically is the, cop is the protection of intellectual property, meaning songs. When a person writes lyrics, put it on a piece of paper, napkin, or whatever case, it's copywritten. If a person even records it, it's copywritten. But you want to still get it filed with the Library of Congress for litigation purposes in case it has to go to court. But the composition itself, when it, com when it comes to copyrights, the composition is basically a song that's written and is published on paper. And it becomes a sound recording as a copyright when it's actually recorded in the studio, in someone's home recording studio, or whatever the case. So there's two parts of that copyright that protects those songs, the sound recording and the composition. Now, publishing companies. What was the, what's the main purpose of the publishing company? The publishing company is to, they're there to take the songs so they can be used for different sources other than just performance. There's usually six type of licenses that are issued, so this can be, goes out. You know, there are the sync licenses, which allows music to be synced to, to TV, commercials, uh, movies, things like that. This is, there's the mechanical license, which means the song, it can be attached to any type of media format, i.e. CDs digital downloads, or whatever the case may be. There's the master license, which is allows the songs to be used. There's the public performance license, which allows the song um, to be played in, in public, whether it's being sung live, on the radio, and so forth. Um, the, and a lot of times the master license, or whatever the case, and the public performance license, most of the time, the master license allow the song to be, you know, whatever the case may be. There's the print right license, which allows if it's going to be printed on sheet music, whatever the case may be, that the license allow it to be printed on paper so it could be used in marching bands, college bands, and so forth. And then, of course, there's grand licenses, which allows it to be performed on Broadway. Um, a little bit later in detail, I'm not going to go a whole lot of detail, but this is the money maker, the big money maker for why record labels want to own the masters and they want to own publishing. And that's why they, a lot of times most artists do not, they don't want the artist to own this because if the artists own it, the uh, record label can't make more money 
because uh, a, a recording artist makes money not only um, when their stuff is not selling or if there is being sold, you know, we're talking about CDs in stores or whatever, but uh, the song can also be used in so many other ways to make this record label money. You know, it might be on a TV, might be used for a theme. You know, like everyone remember the show, the TV show Friends. Well, that theme song, that theme is a song that they just, you know, they got a license to use. And a lot of times these TV or radio and all these different places will get these licenses and, and then they'll buy these one-time license or maybe an, an annual license that's renewed every year, whatever the case may be. Um, it's kind of like when you think of license, it's no different if you buy software like uh, a DAW software or if you buy a plugin or whatever the case. Excuse me. When you buy the license, what it does, it allows you to use the, it allows you the software, it becomes usable, usable for the consumer once you buy the license. Once you install the license, the, now you're able to use the software forever because you buy a one-time license. And that's why everyone has a key, and the key's different. My key to the same software, my license key would be different from yours. But we both bought the software, but the software's not usable until we buy the license. Okay, so so basically the same concept to that point. But you can see when a song, when a um, when a when, and I'm gonna talk about PROs in a minute too. When an artist right does a song, they record a song, and the masters, the record label owns the masters. So what happens is when these record label, when the artist, the artist, only time the artist, when they don't own anything, they don't write the songs or not like that. They just go to the studio, write the, and perform these songs. What happens is all the music, oh, when PROs like BMI or ASCAP is collecting the money from all these different places that are going to use these songs, such as the radio, TV, and so forth, commercial cruise ships, movies, or whatever. Uh, that's gonna be pro you know what when it comes to performances, satellite radio, things like that. When they're using this, when they're collecting the money, the money's only gonna PR is gonna usually collect the money for the people that own the masters, the master license, and the publishing companies which is going to split that money between the publishing company and the, uh, there I go with the poop again, sorry about that, the, um, and the uh, songwriters. So the artist isn't included, is not included in that equation unless the artist, maybe they're an independent artist and they own their own masters, they own their own publishing. Then everything that's collected for publishing and PROs go to the artist because they are not, not only are the artist, they are also they own their own publishing and they own their own their own masters. This is the main reason why they say that most record labels can be shady because not only are they taking majority of the sales, they're taking the publishing money and they're taking the PRO money too. So the only way the artists can make any money is the tour. The problem with touring is you can only tour if you're hoping that every place that you're going to tour, you're going to sell out concert tickets because you have to sell enough concert tickets to offset what it costs to book those places. You know, most of the time, every time you go, you have every time place that you tour, you have to get lights, you have to get uh, the stage set up, you have to get the audio, such as the speaker system and the PA system, and you have to pay those PA companies and light companies and security and that can become expensive, yet alone to travel to those places. The cost of the travel, whether it's on the tour bus, the cost of the tour bus itself, the, um, the other tour van, which got all the equipment in it, the band, the dancers. You have to pay for the food, the security, the hotel room, 
the traveling back and forth to each hotel room. And this is in, this is to, to every single city. That's why this thing can become expensive really, really quick. But that's what publishing companies are. This is the reason why a publishing company, that's why people say it's so important on publishing as well as PROs. PROs and publishing is where you collect your royalties. The only other time an artist can make money is to tour. But if you got things like coronavirus, things like that, you can't tour because places are shut down. So that's the thing. Or, you know, you got all these open venues or you're trying to tour. And that's only if you can sell enough tickets. If you don't sell enough tickets to pay, you know, and what happens is you develop a reputation that if you're booking all these places and you're not selling every time you book and let's say this place can book a thousand people and only 300 people are showing, that places are not most likely to book the, to allow you to rent that place again because they don't want to lose money because those places have to make money every time they, they you know, they, they figure why would I want to book to you where you're only going to sell 300 tickets? I can sit at that. I can see the thousand people. Your reputation is only bringing an average of 300 people. When I could book it to like an usher or Beyonce that's going to sell the place out, I make more money beat with Beyonce or usher. Or they might take a chance and book you on a night that they know that they're not. It's not going to be their biggest night. It's the same thing with clubs. You know, clubs only like to book where they can get the biggest crowds. Everyone is trying to make money out of this deal. Everyone's trying to make money. Record labels, P, you know, everyone's making money. Publishing companies, PROs, record label, record executives, producers, artist managers, everyone's trying to get a piece of this money. So here is your music streaming. Look at the percentage of what you'll make for streaming. That's why most people aren't making a whole lot of money streaming on all these different types of places. You have to stream a lot. And this is the percentage, this is the percentage of the numbers off of, for example, look at Pandora, point zero 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 one three fourth of a dollar. And that's so you would have to stream you're talking to millions to get maybe five or six bucks. You know, and the same thing with Spotify and so forth. So people think, oh I'm just gonna stream my music. Well you, you better hope you get a lot of streams. We were talking billions of streams. The only, like I said, you're only going to get those streams if you're extremely popular. Like I said, when it comes to the music industry, there's there's the marketing. This is um. This is where a lot of places where artists are hoping to break into. You know, you touring. You know, you gotta have enough marketing and promotion to, to be able to tour. There's TV and radio appearances, such as The Tonight Show, maybe uh, The Breakfast Club, you know, for radio appearances, whatever. You're selling merchandise, maybe your T-shirts with your picture on it, your memorabilia, your hats, chains, T-shirts, stuff like that. You're trying to land your stuff on maybe terrestrial radio, which is your AM and FM broadcasting. There's internet radio. There's streaming sites, Spotify, Pandora. Our heart rate, our you know, iHeart Radio, Apple Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Reverb Nation. Then there's hard physical hard sales, such you know, like you know, selling yours because people still do buy CDs. You know, you got Google Play, Walmart, Target, Best Buy, you know, online. You're trying to get advertisement with billboard signs. You're trying to get enough TV and radio advertisement to let you know where places you're going to be touring. You got to make out a schedule. It's a lot. You can see it's a lot to the music industry. Uh, another thing, the awards and academies. Let's talk about the RIAA. Their job is to track, to give sales awards to record labels that have artists that's, that have sold um, enough copies to become certified, whether 500,000 units would land them a gold uh, award. That's the one that looked like the gold album. And then uh, a million copies would land them a platinum, two million double platinum, three million triple platinum, all the way up to 10 million, which is diamond. So you'll see that. And then, of course, there is the actual academies where there are voting boards. And the voting boards are pushing 
these academies to get certain artists awards, such, such as the Grammys, CMA, Country Music Awards, MTV, Music TV Awards, NAACP you know, Awards, Soul Train Awards, American Music Awards, Kennedy Awards, Stella Awards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there are voting boards that vote on these artists, and they're, they're basically, you know, in these different categories, you know, whether it's best rapper, new rapper, rapper of the year, you know, singer of the year, best group, new group, and so forth, all these different categories. And these people will vote. And some people say that the Academy is rigged with the Grammys, CMAs, or whatever. Uh, I've heard that. I don't know, not for sure. But the one thing that can't be rigged is the RIA. This is the reason why um, when it comes to Billboard and RIAA, both of these are tracking sales. That's why you have physical hard sales. That's why you need to be registered with Sound Exchange and Sound Scan because if your stuff is selling, how whatever sources it's selling through, the RIAA and Billboard is going to track it. And once you start charting, or once you start, you sell enough copies, 500,000 or more, you're going to start receiving awards. That doesn't happen very much. That's why it's important for people to support the artists by buying their music some way, somehow, digitally or physical hard sale. It helps the artists with credibility. It helps the artists so much when you're buying their music. Of course, you know, like I said, you know, the RIA, you can see the, uh, you can see the, uh, you know, Platinum or Gold Award or whatever the case may be, and then the different music academies, American Music Award, um, the Grammy, MTV Awards, the Billboard Awards, and so forth. And other than trying to collect royalty checks, um, now, a recording artist, the only way a recording artist makes money is the tour. But if a recording artist can also be a songwriter and they can they own their masters and, and they own their own publishing, then they can start receiving more than they can start receiving royalty checks because they own their property. That's the reason why it's such a hard when you're trying to negotiate a contract deal, why it's so hard to do that for new artists. And they don't learn this until later on. So, and of course, if you're an independent artist, here are a few independent uh, distribution companies. But there's a video on talking about the pros and cons of these different independent companies. And of course, a couple of them that I admit, you know, like SoundCloud, there's one RPM and a few more. There's a lot of independent distribution companies that uh, an independent artist should know about. Here's our few. And then, of course, there's still companies like disc makers and other manufacturing companies because you still want to make some CDs um, to put on Amazon and, and different places like that. Another thing that you want to pay for, pay attention to, another thing that you want to pay attention to is you definitely want to pay attention to what genre is the most successful when it comes to sales and everything else, especially sales. You can see here which percentage of the market is making the most, um, uh, selling the most in these markets. And these courses are a few years old, but it's not that old. And then, of course, right here to the to the left, you can see what's what's the most popular sales. Streaming has streaming has really blown up. You can see it doesn't have as much sales as it did in 1990s and early 2000s for CDs, but you can see when, you know, we're talking way back in the day, it was vinyls, then it went to cassettes, then it went to CDs, then it went to digital downloads, now it's streaming. You can see how it became extremely popular, wh how, you know, where it grew and then when it started declining. Now I got to the point where people stopped really buying vinyls around, look at the year. Then look when people really stopped buying cassettes, early 2000s. Look when people, you know, was really moving from cassettes to CDs. Then look how it's, you know, fail off, fail. It barely, people barely buy CDs, but CDs are still being sold. You can see the little market. 
um, digital downloads. You can see where it fell off because now people are doing streaming websites like Spotify and Pandora. So it's growing until that's just the nature of the music industry. Before, before vinyls and everything else, it was actual print sheet music. That's why you had to print license for that very reason. People really don't need a print license because most people don't buy sheet music except for your high school and your college bands for bands. Other than that, that's the only time people are buying sheet music. Some people buy sheet music to take it home to play on their instruments like pianos and guitars at home. But most people, it's just not a, you know, it's a really tiny market. But you can see the market, you know, Latin music or Christian music. Christian music and all that is a really small market. You can see the biggest markets, you know. So this is something else you want to pay attention to. And that's going to do it. Um, that's going to do it. So that's why I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning of the, I'm going to go all the way back to the very beginning of the video. Okay. So this is a, just a brief video and i probably didn't scratch the surface but these are a lot of the areas of the music record label um when it comes to understanding the music industry you want to these are some of the areas that you really want to concentrate on if you really want to understand the music industry you got to understand there's a lot more to it than just you know buying uh, a digital audio workstation with some plugins, creating a few songs or beats, and then putting it on Reverb and SoundCloud, and then wondering why you're not going to generate any revenue or anything like that. Like you know, you, you and you wonder why you're not on any, you know, you're not getting any awards, you know, you're not populating on Billboard and things like that. You know, you're not at any award shows, you're not getting any tickets or. You wonder why all this, because if you're not concentrating on this, the entire portion of the music industry to include what's going on with the record labels and independent artists and understand the sales and everything else, this is why. You need to understand what's going on with Billboard, Sound Exchange, Sound Scan. There are other places that you can, you know, um, basically, you know, become a member of, become a member of Billboard. You can become a member. Oh, we got you know, like RIAA. Even as an independent record label, you can become a member of the RIAA as an independent record label, as long as you have a certified record label, meaning that it it has a tax ID number. It you know, and it it has, you know, what your, it's uh it's um under your DVA office or your you know it has an LLC license, as an independent a record label. You know, you have your publishing company. You can start your publishing company. And um, even as a, you know, if you have a recording studio and all that, become a member of your audio engineering society and all that. If you have a record label, a publishing company, and, uh, you know, and you're a member of AES and audio engineering society and stuff like that, then you can become a member of the NAM. And you go to these different places like the NAM and audio engineering society when they have conventions where they're introducing new gear and you can also network. You got to get out there and network and so forth. You know, um, rock and roll hall of fame. They, they take memberships so you can get, um, what's going on with the rock and roll hall of fame. Um, a lot of these, um, all these different networking places allow you to, um, you can start getting your name out there. And before you know, it, you start meeting people and when you start meeting people, doors to start opening so this is a short run of the music industry um and that's going to do it for this video i know it's going on an hour i appreciate you watching um and uh that's going to do it so i'm going to post this and y'all hope you have a great day it's election day and get out there and vote if you haven't voted please go out there and vote and uh, everyone be careful, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Y'all have a great one.